over to him quickly, after which we'll continue with the conversation. So, Mr. Kojopo Nkrumah, who is the Minister of Information, thank you so much for joining us and good morning. Good morning, Bella, and uh, good morning to Anita. Let me uh, say that I'm excited at the tree and gun that you ladies have been trying to speak. Oh, yeah, Darcy, yeah, Darcy. We're, we're switching to Airware, Hausa, and a number of other languages soon, so get ready for that. But also thank you for the good work that you're doing, updating Ghanaians on the situation on the ground. And my first question to you would be that we want to understand what the national number in terms of tests is. I believe that even before the president spoke to us during his uh, fifth address where he said that we were waiting for some 15,000 um, you know, test results from enhanced contact tracing, and that is what will inform government on what decision to take moving forward in terms of extending the lockdown or other measures to be taken. There were some tests that, um, you know, took place even before mandatory quarantine as well. Now, we, are, we understand that we have just about 44,471 um, tests that have been done. Is that the national figure or did we conduct some tests earlier and has that been put aside? So let me share with you the data that I have as at this morning. Okay. That as at this morning, we have done... 50,517 mm -hmm. tests. Okay. Now, that will be broken between four major categories. Mm -hmm. For the normal surveillance, which is what you are asking about. Yes. We have done about 13,838 tests. Okay. And then for the enhanced um, tracing and testing, mm -hmm. we've done 34,657 tests. All right. Now, for mandatory quarantine, we have done 2,011 tests. Okay. In um, Accra and 11 tests from Tamale. Okay. It is a combination of these tests that come together to give us 50,517 tests. That's the data that I have this morning. Okay. For each of these categories, then you know the numbers of positives. So, for example, um, uh, mandatory quarantine in Accra, 2011 tests, 105 tested positive. Mm -hmm. Tamale, 11 tests, 10 tested positive. Normal surveillance, uh, 13,838, 268 tested positive. Mm. Um, then you have um, enhanced tracing and testing, 34,657. You have 253 testing positive. That is what brings you to the total of 636 positive as at now. Okay. And that 636, you can nuance it in two broad ways, which is very significant. First... Who are those who we are finding as positive cases because they generally developed symptoms and came to us, which is the traditional approach that many countries have been using mm -hmm. and which is what we have believed needs to be changed. That's 268 from the normal surveillance. Yeah. And then you put all the others together, totaling 368, mm -hmm. which is as a result of the new approach that we are adopting to go out there in search um, of the virus. I see. Um, the two is what will come together to give you the 636. Now, now all these tests, uh, the numbers that you've given us, I do understand as well that there are people who have had to do a double testing. Uh, some people leaving three tests because they tested positive and had to go in for treatment. Now they had to test twice to see if they were, had really recovered. We're waiting for some 66 other people who, um, you know, their final test will determine if they fully recovered or not. So the number you've given us, does it include the double test or are we separating that from the number of tests that we've done? So it will include it. That's my understanding. It would include it because the data as I have here and I've explained to you is mm -hmm. data that uh, does two things. It helps you to see how aggressively you are testing on case counts. Yeah. Because um, if, you, if, you, if you want to go ahead of the virus... The, the, the strategy is that you need to test as many people as possible within a million of your population or the yeah. benchmark um, so that you can have a determination of how much 
of that segment of your population mm -hmm. uh, has a positive count. Okay. Now, to do so means that even if you have to, in cases like this, test some persons more than once, they mm -hmm. form part of your case count if it is just a negligible number. So you find out that if we've done 50,000 tests and we've tested, um, let's say, some, some thousand people, yeah. double, even if you took that out, that would be 49,000 tests. Yeah. So it doesn't really change much the mm. quantum of tests that I you see. have done. But this data, as I've presented to you, will account for all of those tests. So then this brings me to the issue of the number of test kits that we have in the country. Because I also remember that uh, it was reported, it was announced that we had ordered some 50,000 test kits. I remember that the Jack Ma Foundation also sent us about 20,000 test kits and the Chinese government also donated. We've had people donate as many as possible. Currently, how many test kits do we have in the country? Because I'm getting wind of the fact that we received some 25,000 of what the president ordered. Um, so that's no. what we have. Is that true? No, no, no. It's a lot more than that. I think the last time that we asked the Ghana Health Service, they gave us a number of about 40,000. Indeed, the first time they said about 25 and they were expecting the rest. Then the second time at one of our press briefings, I think last week, they said they were uh, a bit above 40,000. I think about 42,000 was what Dr. Abuati mentioned okay. to us. But you are right. 50,000 by the Republic was our target. Uh, then the Jack Ma Foundation and a number of private sources. Indeed, right now, we're trying to clear about 13,000 test kits from DHL, which uh, come in as a donation from um, a third party. Um, test, test, test is the formula, and you want to ramp up as much as possible. This morning, if you look at the data, mm. um, Ghana is, I think, one of the top two countries when it comes to testing uh, in Africa. Yeah. And it is because we have uh, ramped up our strategy to ensure that we are ahead um, of the numbers and we will continue doing so as that, fast as possible. That's great news. But then equitable distribution of PPEs, um, that's also another concern that we have. We've had some people um, doing the contact tracing complaining that if there are about five people who've been sent to a community, in most cases, there's only one person that is fully clothed with the protective gear, and other people have to go to the communities without the PPEs because there's not enough for them. Some go even without boots. So it's either you get the gloves and the face mask um, and you don't get the boots or you don't get the overalls and all of that. And so that also has come to our notice. How are we managing this particular situation? So, Bella, first of all, um, the logistics, PPE, et cetera, required to tackle this pandemic is short in global supply. Mm. Globally, okay. from the U.S. to Europe, Asia, here in Africa, it's in short supply. So, first of all, it's not as though there's a huge stock that people are deliberately refusing to make available. Mm. Secondly, when we say PPEs, not everybody requires the same kind of PPE at every stage of the process. Okay, break it down for us. For example, okay, so for example, the public health nurse who is involved in uh, even pre-triaging or the clinical nurse who is involved in pre-triaging outside the OPD, mm -hmm. receiving patients and saying, you are pregnant to mango here, you are coughing, go here, does not require the same kind of PPE as the person at the ICU. Yeah. This person at the front may require a nose mask, an N95, and then some gloves. Okay. Um, a doctor at OPD may require maybe an N95 and gloves. Somebody at ICU may require a nose mask or a glass face mask, the coveralls, gloves, and boots. Mm -hmm. So different levels of PPEs may be required at um, uh, different points in time. Indeed, if you look at those in the ambulances, yeah. when they are dealing with a particular case, what the driver may have or may be required to have because of how it's compartmentalized, it's not the same as what the um, medical practitioner who is um, attending to the patient will be required to have. What the patient will even be given. The patient may just be given the mask, mm -hmm. but not everything. So I think we also have to do some education also for our colleagues to understand that the mere fact that you are going out as part of a contact tracing team does not mean that every one of them requires boots, coveralls, N95 glass mask. So... But there will be some 
okay. um, variations in who is actually dealing with the patient and what that person requires. So even though the rest may require a mask and gloves generally, also to rationalize the numbers because of what I've said earlier that mm -hmm. globally the short supply, it may as well be that what they are saying is that the one who is actually going to take the sample is the one that must be in the coverall and the mask and the glass uh, uh, facial covering and the boots and everything, while the immigration person or the driver, et cetera, may just may be just... in the basic. So they also we, should have, have... Now... we should have done this education, sorry to cut you, but we should have done this education before um, sending them out to the communities, shouldn't we? My understanding is that this education is being done. But you know, education is a process. It's not an event that the mere fact that you've done it, everybody's gotten it mm. um, at a go. And some of these interactions are useful so that we are able to you know, uh, provide better explanation and also get a better understanding of people's um, expectations. Okay. Then the final thing is that because we acknowledge that there's global short supply, we're also producing some here in Ghana. Indeed, yeah. Tomorrow morning, the minister responsible for trade will join us at our uh, minister's briefing to give us an update on the numbers and quantities we are producing here in Ghana mm -hmm. to augment the limited supply that we are uh, importing. You notice that earlier, the general client call was that we don't have PPEs. Yeah. Now what you are hearing is that we have, but not all of us have the same type, mm -hmm. and which is why I'm explaining the differences. And then you have medical facilities that call us and say, we have some here, but it's only at ICU. Those at OPD and at emergency and, uh, you know, pre triaging stage don't have it. Yeah. What we've done is to introduce a call center, 311, and we encourage these persons to call and mm -hmm. give the feedback so that we can also now feed back to those who are doing the distribution and the medical directors that this is the last mile nuance. Please attend to it. Okay, now we're getting an indication that in some of our major hospitals, um, due to lack of equipment and all the things they need to be able to treat some of these patients, they are having to wash the bed sheets and some of the things that they use in treating the patients so they can have enough to treat other patients as well. Has this come to your notice? And is this even right? Um, this is news to me. We'll be happy to get the details so that we can um, check with the doctors and the experts and the clinicians who are uh, well-schooled in these matters to ensure that if there's a gap there, it is corrected. And that if, for example, best sheets um, of a particular caliber are reusable um, after disinfection and treatment, then it is also explained to people, then they don't get alarmed. But right. we'll be happy to know the specifics so that we can better connect the dots. Definitely. And it's, it's from Kolebu. They're also asking for gloves as well. But this is just to draw your attention to it so that you can speak to the authorities to do something about it. But two days Let ago... Me all right. So Kolebu, having to wash bed sheets, having to recycle some of uh, the equipment that they need to take care of some of um, you know, the patients as well. Now, two days ago, I know that the Ghana Health Service has put out a communique asking or banning health professionals from giving information about what really may be happening on the ground. And so they're allowed to educate the public, but not tell us into details what the challenges may be for health professionals. At the same time, um, well, I got a communique here that said that because it was, it was at least letting them that it was wrong for them to speak to the media, to run to the media with their challenges, but rather speak to the authorities. But two days ago, we received an information from one of the contact tracers who said that um, they tested one of the people in the community on the 2nd of April. Now, some eight days down the line, they realized that this man was positive for coronavirus. So they alerted the national authorities to pick him up because this man lives in a compound house with the rest of his family. He's been coughing. And for three days, they did not pick him up. There were excuses upon excuses. And so they didn't have a choice than to come to the media because then if the media spoke about it, maybe the authorities would realize how serious this is. How are we managing some of these situations? Because now another member of the family is also showing symptoms of coronavirus, diarrhea and headache. And we're getting indication that he still has not been picked up. How are we managing these situations? So I was shaking my head because um, I also saw that communication from the Eastern Regional Director of the Ghana Health Service okay. to public health professionals in the Eastern Region. And mm -hmm. I actually got on the phone to find out what is happening. Mm -hmm. And she explained that, yes, people have been um, provided with basic training, etc., to go out there and do public education and go out there and do their work. But they are not comfortable with a situation where sometimes before you, the uh, public health director, get to hear of the challenge or the nuance to attend to it, mm -hmm. it is on the radio or it is on the television. 
it makes it difficult sometimes for them to even understand what is going on and deal with it. And so that letter to her people was to get them to understand that they need to come back to them. Okay. And not necessarily just um, believe that we are solving everything on radio and on TV. Okay. So it's to get back to them directly. But no, they are not. Because we're actually saying that, and the reason for which I call there is because we are working with them and the Ghana Medical Association to make available doctors and nurses to do public education. Mm -hmm. So if you say people shouldn't talk to the media, yeah. how do we do education? But then she explained it to me that this was the context within which um, that was happening. Okay. And we would like to encourage. We have hotlines. The 311 line is available. If you have challenges, call. Your district directors are there. You can call. You can even go up to higher levels and call and have them follow up. Now to the specifics. Um, we don't want our health system to get overwhelmed. In many mm -hmm. parts of the world, if the health system gets overwhelmed, they will not even be able to attend to patients and we'll have a lot more of these um, instances. And that's yeah. why we continue to ask people to help us to uh, follow the protocols. If you have challenges, call let them come and take the samples and if it's positive, and if they are able to quickly get um, a, a holding facility, they are able to move that person. Admittedly, there have been one or two instances where they have not been able to get a holding facility in good time. Okay. So it has taken a bit of time before they have moved the patient from home or from the initial uh, place of discovery to a holding facility. And we uh, continue to encourage them to do better at that. There have been instances where some health facilities have also been in a hurry to get rid of people. Mm. So they quickly call the ambulance service, hand them over and close their doors. In, indeed, in one instance, they did not wait for the next facility to prepare to receive yeah. and got the patient into the ambulance. When they couldn't receive and were bringing back, they refused to accept. So there have been a couple of challenges there. We want to be clear that we don't want to get overwhelmed, mm. but we also continue to encourage them that they should do well to ensure that they're able to move people out. And that is why it is important to make available more isolation centers and treatment centers across the country. And that is why maybe I'll take advantage to uh, uh, speak to communities out there that if somebody offers an isolation or a treatment center in your locality, mm -hmm. uh, that should be used. Why it is important is that it even protects you. Okay. So that if somebody is tested positive in your neighborhood, we don't leave that person out there in the general population to cross infect other people. Mm -hmm. We can move that person to the isolation center for that person to be managed and assisted to uh, recover and then come back home. So it is actually in your own interest to help us have some of these isolation centers across the country mm -hmm. so that we can treat people in these isolation centers. And therefore, okay. people don't have to delay so much at home uh, or at other places of first discovery before they are moved. Speaking of these isolation centers, so yesterday there was an update on the 10 Guineans. Um, you know, well, as of now, I guess there are only seven that are in the guest house in Tamale. I think the other one person is on the run and the other two should be in a health facility. Uh, pardon me if I got that wrong. But then the people who live next to the guest house are complaining now because they are also facing stigma. The rest of the community doesn't want to get close to them. They can't even go out and buy food because everybody points at them and says that they are the people who live next to the isolation center. And these are some of the reasons why a lot of people are uh, speaking against having the isolation centers in the city, close to homes. What do you say about that as well? There are two things we have to do. We have to deepen public education to the last mile of our country in every language so that people can understand that this um, medical condition is not a death sentence. Mm -hmm. sentence. In this, in Ghana, indeed in Ghana right now, 17 persons are fully recovered. 66 of them, we are finishing their second test so that we can say they are fully recovered. Yeah. It's a condition that you can recover from. We just don't want you to uh, uh, become so symptomatic and have high viral loads that you then go into critical care and we may need ventilators, et cetera. Um, we admit that education has gone very far, very mm. far, but we still have pockets who either don't believe it or want to see dead bodies before they believe it or just haven't heard it. Yeah. And we need to do a lot more. And that's why we are happy uh, that you, our colleagues in the media, are helping us out across various languages, which is not what you traditionally do. In yeah. The Information Services Department is doing a lot of it on the ground. Now the chiefs, through the Ministry of Chieftains, are also getting involved to get word out there. That's one major thing we have to do and continue doing. Okay. Secondly, 
we have to also fight stigmatization. And yesterday, Dr. Ama Edwin, who is one of the advisors mm -hmm. uh, on um, social policy and stigma management as part of this response program, joined us at our press briefing. We have to do a lot more uh, anti-stigma engagement for people to understand. I, for example, go to parliament and I have colleague ministers who call me Corona MP, hey, Corona minister, oh. COVID minister. That may be on the lighter side. Yeah. But those are the beginnings of, you know, um, stigma and tagging and pointing fingers, etc. Et et mm -hmm. But we need to do a lot more so that we are able to demystify it and therefore get um, communities more accepting. Uh, okay. of these isolation and treatment centers. I mean, talking about education, yesterday you mentioned this, your deputy minister also uh, gave us an idea of the eight languages that would have the president's address, the press briefings, plus other policies translated into. And we want to understand how soon this is happening. And my second question in relation to this um, would be that, so are we going to be translating all the information the president gave, all the addresses from day one, Till now, are we going to translate all of them and replay? And how then do we make sure that people don't see address number one and assume that that is the current address, um, you know, in society now? And so they might stick to that and not really know what's happening currently. Yeah, so we have started from the president's last address. Okay, okay. So his last address has already been translated across the eight languages and it's uh, being availed through the Ghana Journalists Association and the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association across media platforms too. Um, stations across the country. We started, um, I think, two days ago, even before yesterday. Mm. That was when the Bureau of Ghana Languages gave us the first set of uh, translated messages that are out. And then yesterday's briefing is also now this morning being uh, worked on. And that is why at all of these briefings and in the president's addresses, he tries to recap some of the major things that have um, been done already. Mm. So that even starting from here, the major message trans, you would also be able to get it um, okay. moving forward. For those who have hearing impairments, mm -hmm. we have done sign language versions of them, which are also being availed uh, for playback, mostly on um, uh, television and then on uh, social media uh, platforms as well. Okay. Well, that's great news. That means that we're not going to translate address number one, address number two, only the previous address, which is address number six and number five. That's where we've right? started from, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you for that update. And we're waiting, um, you know, as soon as possible for that to go on air. Now, let's move away and start talking about water distribution and the issue concerning people still buying water. I know that the president spoke uh, about it during his address. You also had the Minister of Water and Sanitation come out to speak and say that they're writing letters to the NGOs that provide community water services and also independent water tanker suppliers should be able to, you know, um, give water for free. There are people who are still paying for water as we speak. There are homes where the water sellers have closed their tanks and are not selling the water because they are worried that they are running at a loss, even though government has insisted that we're going to give water. Now, the water tanker suppliers, the private ones, are saying that we also spend money in buying fuel. So if we even get the water for free, transporting it back you know, to the community will cost us something. We need to make money to feed our families. And so because of that, they are not giving the water for free. What is government doing about this as well? So first word of caution is that if you're having challenges in your local community, you can call 311, give us specific information so that we can follow up specifically and deal with. You can also let your unit committee member, that's the lowest um, denominator in the district or the municipal area, be aware and they can then um, uh, um, ferry the information to the district assembly so that some action can be taken. Mm -hmm. What we've been speaking about is what you would call public water. Yeah. Or water being provided by government. So water running through the taps, Ghana Water Company Limited tankers, Ghana Water Company Limited commandeered tankers mm -hmm. are the ones we are talking about. If you have a challenge where um, maybe somebody has a well in his house, mm -hmm and usually, or a borehole in his house, and usually makes that borehole um, available to people in the community. It will be difficult for you to say that that person should give that borehole water to people for free by force just because government has said so. That's a reality we must begin to acknowledge. Yeah. If somebody's private water resource is making it available. Mm -hmm. He may not want to give it to you for free, even when government is giving public water available for free. 
If you have a situation where somebody has this and even wants to give it away for free, but says, I use electricity in pumping the water. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that my electricity is not lifeline electricity, I want to charge you for electricity. That comes with its own um, difficulties. But for all public water resources uh, put together by Community Water and Sanitation or Ghana Water Company Limited, they are affected by this program. And if you have any challenges with any of these in a specific area, we encourage you to give us a feedback so that uh, attention can be given to them. So wait, are you saying that for people who have their own boreholes and wells and all that, they are allowed to sell the water? We are not saying that they are allowed to sell the water. We are saying that we would encourage that if at this stage, as government is doing so, if they can also make this available for free, it will be helpful. But the reality, Bella, is that if somebody has dug a borehole in front of his house mm -hmm. and has been um, maybe selling it to people, it will be difficult for you to tell that somebody to give it to people for free or for you to insist without compensating the person. It's like somebody who produces sachet water or mineral water from their own borehole. Mm -hmm. You can't say that because government is giving public water for free. They are also now by compulsion required to give their bottles of water. What about the water tankers who get the water for free from, um, you know, government? So they go fetch it from, you know, a pipe somewhere and still come and charge you. Those are it. the ones that will fit in the public water category that I'm talking about, which is what we are saying. But if you are having challenges with them, then uh, do, guys, do give us that feedback at 311 and let's feed it back into the... Um, Ghana Water Company Limited and the Ministry of Water Structure so that they can attend to it specifically. Mm. Did you also uh, mention that there would be provision of poly tanks in the communities in order to provide these communities some water? And when is this happening? I don't have detail on poly tanks, okay. but um, the feedback I have, the brief I have is Ghana Water Company Limited tankers and then private tankers that have been commandeered by uh, the Ministry of Water and Sanitation to assist in this process. They are the ones that fit into this um, uh, uh, bracket. Those that also deal with the community water and sanitation water systems who are getting paid by what they sell, they are now to be compensated by community water and water sanitation mm -hmm. uh, so that they can make that public water available. For them. By the way, I'm, I'm being told that the numbers 311 and 112 are uh, either always busy or they don't go through. And so people are not able to get through uh, to forward their complaints to the authorities. And so I would want you to kindly check on that for me. I have, I have a report here from last night, um, almost about 12,000 calls from 311, which we manage at the Ministry of Information. It's a 24-hour call center. The reality is that if you have a country of 30 million people um, and several people are calling in, it will delay a little bit. But we encourage you to have a bit of patience and wait as the persons on the line will finish with one call and they will be able to take um, your call as well. The calls come in every day. It's nuanced in various areas. Those who want data on COVID-19, mm -hmm. those who have lockdown feedback, those who have food issues, some who have water issues, security issues, uh, uh, etc. And the calls do come in. Uh, okay. On a daily basis. Well, for those who have to call the 0800 800 800 and 0800 800 900 uh, to receive some hot meals from the gender ministry. Now, there are also calls for, you know, government to add an extra number because the numbers are always jammed. As we do understand, a lot of people require food. We have quite a number of vulnerable people um, in society as well. Now, aside adding an extra number, there's a concern about unequal distribution of food. First of all, we're hearing reports that they are politicizing the sharing of hot meals. What is the mechanic like in ensuring that everybody gets the food and we don't ask for party colors? Because this is an accusation that has been put forward. I'm sure you've seen that video from Dr. Ezanato Rollins complaining bitterly about it. And I've just seen a statement. I have just seen a statement from the Ministry of Gender and Sanitation, which denies that flat out. And I think that what we should do is that instead of repeating that allegation, what we should do is to seek to validate it. Mm. I know your pressmen go out there and are on the ground. The mere fact that a politician has made an allegation doesn't make it true. But she's not Elsa the only one. make allegations about you, Bella. I'm saying mm -hmm. that we have... No, but the fact that she's not the only one doesn't make it true. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that we can make allegations about you, Bella. It doesn't make it true. We have to validate okay. those things. And here's why we have to validate. Because at this time, when the biggest problem we are noticing is that people are not even observing social distancing. Yeah. And that has become the major issue that we are dealing with. It sounds a bit strange when you say that while people are not observing social distancing and the evidence we are seeing, the photos we are seeing, are people crowding up, which we yeah. are very unhappy about mm -hmm. and dealing with. 
then you say that people are actually inspecting party cards during that process. Sounds a bit strange to the ear. So it's important to validate mm -hmm. as a first step before we keep repeating it. Well, but that's, that's what just, we're asking uh, you so you can uh, validate uh, for us, Kojo. Well, no. I mean, it is not about me validating. The person who is making that allegation just shouldn't mouth it and go. Mm -hmm. And our colleagues in the media just shouldn't say that because this person has made an allegation, respond to it. Because I'm saying that the evidence that we are seeing is that people are not observing social distancing. And that's our major worry. And indeed, yesterday we addressed it, that if you can't observe the social distancing, then you might as well not even do it, because you're going to put people in harm's way while you claim to be helping. But is the information... So I'm saying that the evidence mm -hmm. that we are seeing, mm -hmm. the evidence that we are seeing, at first glance, makes it difficult to just take that claim or that allegation hook, line, and sinker. But I'm saying that that's why we have to validate it. But put that aside. This food distribution is being done in three ways. There's mm -hmm. what the government is doing through NADRO. Yeah. There is what the faith-based organizations are doing, either on their own or as a result of what government is making available to them. Okay. Um, and then you also have a third strand of private persons, including politicians, who are doing food distribution, um, private organizations who are doing food distribution. Mm -hmm. Across these three strands, one of the major challenges that we have identified is the non-observation of social distancing. And yesterday, some guidelines were put out on how to ensure that social distancing takes place. Today and tomorrow, it is my understanding that there will be some further nuancing of how to ensure that um, there are enough quantities out there for everybody to also be assisted. Okay. Those are the key considerations that have been evinced before our eyes mm -hmm. that are being tackled. We want to encourage that at this point in time, now is not the time for people to attempt to do political gimmicks, even if you're a politician providing food. Now is not the time to play political gimmickry out of it. Now but but that's why we're hoping that the politics. information ministry would also investigate and be sure that these claims are false. Uh, because you are the mouthpiece of government. And at the same time, you have to also give us that information. And so if we're coming back to you with what we have discovered. Uh, we expect that at least the information ministry will do their background check to be sure that this really is not true. Aside, you know, shifting the blame on us and saying that we have reporters who also can't go. Um, you know, no, 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 no. We're not shifting the blame. We are working in collaboration. Okay. Well, I mean, all that has happened so far, we have worked in collaboration. Indeed, yesterday, if you notice, when we spoke about people distributing food and creating problems. We said there are people or, or, or people spreading fake news. We said mm -hmm. there are people in the ruling party, people in opposition who are doing it. We are not distinguishing between friend okay. or foe at this point in time. And neither are we saying that it's the media's responsibility. No, no, no. All right, all right. We all have to validate it. And that's why I'm saying that the evidence that we have all seen is people not observing social distancing. And that is what we are all tackling. If somebody is making a new claim that in the midst of this chaos, people are not observing social distancing, and that's a bigger challenge, but in the midst of this chaos that we're all seeing, somebody is apparently in these crowds inspecting party cards. Mm. That becomes something that we all have to validate, but not merely just repeat as though it is a fact okay. that has happened. That's all I'm saying. Okay, okay. Uh, but I think the substantive thing is to ensure that social distancing is observed and that we get as many people as possible help in this process. Definitely. And we're looking forward to that. But also the issue about electricity. Yesterday, we were hoping that, uh, you know, you'll touch on it because it was advertised that they'll touch on yeah. the issue of electricity. Yeah. That didn't happen. And so throw more light on it for us. First of all, uh, people with prepaid cards, are they all a part of it? And how does it work? Because there are people who have gone to buy electricity and have been told that, I'm sorry, but it hasn't started yet. So we can't make you buy just 50 percent of it and top up for you. How does it work? And when is it starting? So um, my understanding is that it's from April, May, June, and the credits will start um, May, June, July, one month in lag, using March as the benchmark. Yesterday, I think for about five hours or so, the Ministry for Energy completed um, all the uh, various frequently asked questions that needed to be put together, et cetera. Yeah. Um, we initially advertised that they would join us, as you rightly said, but I think time was not on our side. Okay. But tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, thankfully, uh, the Honorable Minister, uh, uh, John Peter Mehu himself, uh, will lead the charge as we provide a lot more detail on this. He would respond to all of those questions. The numbers have been worked out. The various categories have been worked out. Okay. And the President said 
those who are in the lifeline category, it's free. Those, those who are in other categories, they'll get a 50% discount. Uh, exactly. It's using March as the benchmark. And the details of how you can access it will all be outlined at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning at our next briefing. Does it also include people who are lifeline consumers, but unfortunately find themselves living in a compound house? And so as much as they might pay maybe 50, less than the 20 cities, uh, that makes them lifeline. They have to contribute. And so the electricity bill is probably 200 cities, 300 cities, and so do not form part of it. These are people who have also raised concerns about it. Are we going to address all these issues? So, yes, we'll address all of these issues. You must recognize that the electricity company of Ghana identifies its customers by meters. Okay. Not necessarily how many people are in that house. So, for example, in my house, if I had, I mean, if I live with five or six people in my house, ECG identifies my house by a meter. And it is that meter that is receiving the benefits that is being made available. Mm. The detailed contributions of people in that house may not be what ECD is looking at. They are looking at that meter. And the consumption of that meter is what determines whether that meter customer is lifeline or not. But as I mentioned, more of those details tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Well, I'm still knocking on this door asking one more thing about ASAP and IES and the cost that they've put out that... Uh, you know, government might incur in providing free electricity, which is about $450 million, um, you know, for the three months, I believe. And so that's a total of about 3 billion Ghana cities. How are we supporting ECG to provide this? And moving forward, how do we intend to recover from such huge figures? Because we do understand that it's costing government a lot, um, you know, even during this COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, but government hasn't put out its figures. Um... We very much respect the work that respected CSOs like ASEP and IES. Uh, um, 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 and, um, IES uh, yeah. uh, the figures I have seen are not the figures they are putting out. Their figures are way high. They are higher than, okay. Accurate. Oh, yes. Their figures are not accurate. Do you they have the figures? Way though? high. I do, and tomorrow morning the minister will go through all of those numbers. Uh, okay. Yes, but uh, those figures by IES and ASEP are not correct. But tomorrow okay. the minister will give us. Um, those figures. Remember, we said that using March as the benchmark. Exactly. So you have to go to March and find out what the March numbers are, and then you can extrapolate from there. But tomorrow, the minister would provide those details. Okay, then I'll hold on with my, my questions about electricity till tomorrow. But let's talk about uh, porous borders, because this morning, there have been reports about some 41 people who tried, um, you know, uh, crossing into Ghana. They were intercepted, and they've been sent back. Two of them are Ghanaians, and these people crossed from Côte d'Ivoire. I believe we have an issue um, in Togo as well, where some people also tried crossing into from Ghana to Togo as well. We're saying that we've closed our borders, yet we have people still trying to cross into and outside the country. If we understand that these are some of the challenges that we might face, why are we not tightening security at some of these places? It is because we've tightened security that these people are intercepted. Okay. The immigration service has ramped up its surveillance numbers even among or even along the unauthorized uh, entry points in our country and the porous points that our intelligence systems tell us people sometimes okay. come through. That is how come we are able to intercept these 41 here, X number there, Y number there. Okay. And you notice that whenever immigration joins us, they give us an update of those who try to come in, who are arrested, okay. who are being repatriated or who are in custody. Okay. But there's a more significant point that I want to speak to. Mm. The people who are indulging in these breaches are supported by Ghanaians. Okay. They're supported by Ghanaians. What are we doing time, to them? Critical national need. Mm -hmm. When the president, the government, and the system are making all efforts to protect all of us, there are still some of us who will get on a motorbike and go to Togo or to Ivory Coast or to Burkina Faso and try and assist somebody coming through an illegal route. These persons are going to be subjected to the law. As the Immigration Service always uh, uh, informs us, they are arresting such persons, they will face the full rigors of the law. But I think we should also use you know, platforms like yours to call out to such persons. Okay. If we're going to succeed in this battle against COVID-19, it is a whole of Ghana approach. Mm. Not President Akufuado and his government alone. Okay. All of us must be concerned, patriotic enough, serious enough, committed enough, disciplined enough to support 
the government efforts so that we succeed. Because if the leadership, the government, the immigration service are doing their best, and you decide to get on a motorbike and go and fetch somebody and bring him in, mm -hmm. you're undermining the entire government effort. COVID-19, if the theory is right, it was one person who got infected. Yeah. And now we have over now a million. We have, yeah. One person who is not supporting the national exercise in Ghana puts all of us at risk. And so yeah. we should also take advantage of the opportunity and call out to our brothers and sisters who are undermining the national effort. Those who are spreading false stories, those who are uh, uh, misinforming the public, those who are trying to smuggle people in. It's an unpatriotic exercise that undermines the national effort. Those who are just trying to do politics with it, these are all unpatriotic exercises that undermine the national effort, and we should desist from it. All right. Thank you so much, Kojo Ponkuma. I wish I could have asked you all day the questions I have, but I know that you also have to uh, do some work. And so at this point, we'll just wait patiently for the updates on electricity especially. But we're grateful for your time on COVID-19 360. And Thank Nemi you for the <laughs> uh, okay, so anyway, that was our information minister, Honorable Kojo Opong Nkuma, speaking to some of the issues that have been raised by individuals all across the country. And I hope that you got the updates that you needed. Tomorrow morning, they'll give us further explanation on electricity tariffs and how it's going to be distributed in the country as well. It's COVID-19 360. We'll come back with more.